Hi guys. We're back to find out what happens next in Polaris. Remember in the last chapter they um, found the rat that was infected by the fungus? So let's find out what happens in chapter 26. Land Ho! Henry gazed at the rat creature's remains through the walls of a clear glass jar, checking once again to make sure that the lid was secured tightly. He carefully turned the jar around in his hands. He felt the weight of the little monster within shift and tumble. The inside of the glass was lightly frosted with fine white spores. He gazed through them into the creature's open mouth. He saw the small tongue inside, a tiny slip of fuzzy whiteness. He noted a few more details, the blackened teeth, the exoskeleton. There was no doubt and it had been transformed by some the same fungus. Remarkable, he thought. It infected entirely different species. He was alone in the cabin now, alone with his thoughts. The species was more adaptable and more contagious than he had feared. His master's legacy was a, a various and opportuni opportunistic predator. These troubling thoughts were cut short by excited cry from out on deck. Did he hear that right, he wondered? But the same call came again. He carefully wrapped the jar in a scrap of blanket and stowed it in the trunk. He locked it tight and then rushed out on the deck. As soon as he emerged from the door, the call came a third time. It was Emma's voice, carrying down from high in the rigging. Land ho, she called. And then, pausing just long enough to gather more breath, she hollered again. Land ho! Are you certain? Aaron called up from his place at the helm. Emma leaned out from the foremast cross trees, her weight far forward, and it was only her extraordinary balance that kept her from toppling out on the perch and splattering onto the deck below. She squinted to the distance, and there it was. It wasn't much more than a fuzzy line rising along the center of the horizon now, but she was sure. She had seen the fuzzy line before, or fuzzy lines like it anyway. The color was darker than the water below it, a green-black rising from the world of blue. It was land, all right, and a lot of it. She leaned back slightly and called down once more. Yes, it's land. I'll get the spyglass, called Owen, who now carried a compass in his vest pocket instead. Emma swung down from the crow's nest and began descending in the rigging. She had been placed up there as lookout, and she had done her job. They had known from their charts that they were approaching Cuba. They'd even spotted a few more sails off in the distance as they approached the busy island. They'd been going too slowly to overtake any of those, of those ships, and instead they kept their eyes out front of the western edge of Cuba. As Emma neared the deck, she knew there was a problem. And as Owen returned from the cabin, already extending the spyglass, she knew what he'd see. Cuba was dead ahead. They'd found it, but they'd found too much of it. She hadn't spotted the western edge of the island off to the starboard. She'd spotted the whole darn thing looming up in front of them. And she knew what that meant. She watched Owen closely as she dropped lightly down to the deck and looked, took up her usual post and beside her sister. He peered through the spyglass, first straight ahead and then very slowly from side to side. He repeated the motions exactly and then deflated utterly. His shoulders slumped and his chin dropped as he lowered the glass from his eyes. Thatcher snatched it away and Owen let him. Something went wrong, he said, his voice soft and distant. He looked up at Emma and met Emma's eyes. She saw the, his confusion, saw him redoing some calculations or other in his head. It's not your fault, she said, and she truly meant it. Anything had gone, could have gone wrong. The calculations could have been a little off or the currents. The steering could have drifted a, a few extra points since they took their last bearings everyone was tired and scared and then of course there was the matter of thatcher ransacking the maps that owen a novice navigator had managed to guide them all this way and get them so close seemed to marvel her the others seemed to agree there it is hollered thatcher where where let's see pleaded aaron hand it over boys i'll have a look said maria but emma knew owen was in no need to celebrate a near miss the plan had been to skirt the past the edge of the island, and then continued on the short distance to the Florida Territory. But they had missed where they were headed directly, toward the middle of Cuba, which Spain ruled with an iron hand. She wondered what he would do next. It was no idle question. In many ways, their entire future, if they were to have one, depended on it. You can't sail through an island, she knew. Only go around it. Suddenly, the spyglass was thrust in her hands. Everyone else had had a turn, and now it was hers. The view through the glass was much the same as the one she... She'd had a loft. The fuzzy line became a fuzzy lump. And as the ship lumbered on, the line grew, not just taller, but also wider. We're striking it amidships, crowed Thatcher. We could hardly miss it now. 
Owen roughly snatched the glass back from Emma's hands and slapped it close. But miss it we will, he said loudly. She turned to look at him. She understood this what, what for what it was. Not rudeness, but a, sh a show of force. A demonstration of will. What do you mean, said Thatcher? You can't possibly be saying. Still staring incredulously at Owen, he pointed straight ahead. It's r there, right there. But it's not where we are going, Owen growled back. He stared back at Thatcher for a few long seconds, and he looked down at the, the whole group, save for Aaron, who has retreated back to the wheel. We will sail around the island into Canino to Florida, as planned, he said. Eyes gazed back at him in disbelief. Mouths o dropped open in astonishment. They had all seen through the maps to know that Cuba was a huge island. Sailing around it would add days to their journey. Her thoughts swirled. They had had a plan, and she agreed with it, but now the plan had failed. But in its failure, had delivered them to a very edge of land. And this was not a coincidence or divine providence that it had happened on the same day that a new sort of monster had been discovered. And it was a new threat that could prove even worse than the boy-faced horror below because the sailing ships, as she knew from bitter experience, were full of rats. She remembered the worst nights when she had been forced to go to sleep with her boots on to keep the rats from gnawing at her feet. Owen turned on his heels and barked an order to the, to the wheel. Hard to pour, Aaron. Aaron blinked. Back at him and responded, Are you joking? I most certainly am not, boomed Owen. You will turn the ship or I will. He took two long forceful strides back to the wheel. Aaron's eyes grew wide and he began turning hard. Owen slowed and then stopped. His hand slapped down on the right shoulder. It was Thatcher's. Uh-oh, thought Emma. Owen spun, his left hand reaching around to peel Thatcher's hand free as, it, as his right hand reaching for his belt. Emma gasped as Owen gripped his pistol. Thatcher released his shoulder and backed away. All eyes were on Owen's right hand. It was only when he followed their gaze that he realized what he had done. Or at least that's what the way it seemed to Emma. Whatever the cause, he quickly dropped the hand from his gun. The ship bucked on the waves and began its abrupt turn to the left. The assembled crew members sank low to keep their balance. Emma reached over to help her sister, stealing a quick look at her bandaged foot. It looked like, like a packet that had fallen off the butcher's wagon and into the street. Maria's balance was solid, even on, the good, on her good leg. And her shoulder felt warm and reassuring under Emma's palm. Maria acknowledged the help with a quick nod. Henry, of course, fell down, banging on one knee on the deck. Ow, he said. Careful there, said Owen. A little distraction seemed to lower the tension slightly. Emma's eyes darted upward, and instinctively to see the wind was hitting the sails and their direction shifted. We'll need to adjust the sheets and stay, she said. The others shot their own quick looks at the flapping canvas. We will, said Thatcher, if we are going to go through with this ludicrous change of course. Emma didn't know what ludicrous meant. But the way Owen visibly bristled at the sound of it, she knew it wasn't good. What do you mean, if, said Owen. I mean that this affects all of us, said Thatcher, narrowing his eyes like a cat on the hunt. And as such, we all deserve a say. I demand a meeting, a vote. He waved his hand around to the, in an abrupt circle, clearly slapping Henry's face. Nearly slapping Henry's face. We all do. Huh, said Henry. Emma was equally as a surprise, herself included. But her sister wasn't. It's only fair, said said Maria, before elbowing Emma, not especially lightly in the side. Oof, said Emma. She wasn't sure she agreed, but she didn't want the, another of her sister's sharp elbows. A meeting couldn't hurt, she said, instantly regretting the choice of words. Hadn't this all begun in the meeting on the deck one stormy night? She said the words without conviction, but they hit Owen like a cannonball in the waterline. She risked a quick look over and saw the expression that flashed across his face. That particular combination of hurt and surprise that meant one thing. Betrayal. I didn't mean, she mumbled. What are you all talking about? Aaron called out from the wheel. A meeting, Maria called back. Aaron smiled widely. Should I keep turning then? Owen looked up from his dark thoughts. Hold this course for now, he said. We'll have our meeting, said Thatcher. Owen nodded. His body was tense and drawn in, like any other animal being hunted. Emma knew he felt outnumbered and wanted to remind him that the votes had not been cast. She couldn't, though, because she still had no idea how she would vote. Yes, we'll meet, said Owen. His eyes scanned to the deck, and then she knew he was thinking of the first meeting, too. But not out here. Not again. The crew filed in the captain's cabin once more. You stay on the helm, Owen said to Aaron, who was still steering his compost course. Uh, neither straight toward the island nor entirely past it. We'll all know, we all know your vote well enough. It wasn't until the cabin door swung shut behind them that Emma realized the full weight of those words. Thatcher, Maria, and Aaron had long been for the nearest land, Owen and Henry seemed just as determined to make landfall in the United States. That only left her. She could create a tie or break one. A tie could get ugly, and so could landfall in Cuba. And yet she would have to decide, not just for her, but for all of them.
Chapter 27. A boat interrupted. Emma took her place in the small table. There was barely enough space for the five of them and the two few chairs, but they made do with a trunk here and a stool there. You all know where I stand, said Owen, as soon as everyone was seated. For a moment, it seemed that's all he would say, but his pride had been hurt and he couldn't resist one last yet try to make his case. This is a United States ship and we must take it back to a port where the those laws and rights will be protected. The Spanish, they'll take everything and send it back to Spain. The Polaris will be a sailing under a new name and a Spanish flag within a week, and we will be lucky not to be working in the cane fields. Ridiculous, said Thatcher. The Spanish are not enemies of ours, and what do I care who owns a ship? It certainly won't be me, and do not threaten me with a forced labor. Am I not already indentured? No, I have suffered enough on this voyage. We all have suffered enough on this voyage. Let us make haste to port in the Spanish rifles and torches kill this horrible thing we carry with us before it kills us. Maria agreed. Yes, Spanish rifles and Cuban, a Cuban doctor, and beyond that, things will be fine. She looked over at Emma, sitting next to her at the little table. We speak Spanish, remember? Nor have we thrown out our headscarves and wraps. Many ships sail from Havana each day, and all, all these ships, boys, especially ones with experience. We will be sailing again within a week. Emma resented being spoken for. She was close to her sister, but she was her own person, too. And the idea of dressing up and playing a boy once again held no appeal for her. The sight of Obe's face in a monster's body had made up her mind. From the first time she'd seen it, she thought, It's a wicked thing to be forced to be something other than yourself. She opened her mouth to speak, but she struggled to get the, her words first. Henry cut it. His voice was expected, but his reason for it caught everyone off guard. We have a responsibility for science. He said. The others, regardless of allegiance, looked around at each other. Emma looked at her sister. Owen looked at Thatcher, and their eyes all said the same thing. Really? To science? Perhaps, sensing the skepticism, Henry raised his voice. The creature lurking between the decks, or creatures, his glance over at his trunk in the corner. They are monstrous, to be sure, but they are also marvels. It is a species entirely unknown to the science and, and capable of remarkable feats of transformation and adaptation. The capture and the study of this species could lead to tremendous benefits. Thatcher cut in. This creature that is ab absorbed, my friend, a creature that you yourself said would try to do the same to us. Henry shrugged weakly. I said it was monstrous. Emma stared at Thatcher. She hadn't realized that he had been friends with Obe, though it made sense now, now that she thought about it. They were both such bitter boys, badly served by their lives. Henry railed. Rally, this is voyage, the voyage you all signed on for. This was a scientific expedition. This species is that science. It is the fruit of our labor, he turned to Owen, and the labor of those who have been lost. And at its grand discovery, if we reach the United States, it will be considered a wonder. The museums and benefactors and the government itself, who have together funded the trip, will get their money's worth. As for us, we will, dare say, have done our part for both science and history. Oh, yes, yes, said Thatcher. It will be quite historic when we sail into a port with our faces bobbing out of slimy insect bodies. He is right, though. It was a scientific expedition, said Owen. It is a scientific expedition, corrected Henry. It is an experiment in everything that can go wrong aboard a boat, said Maria. Enough bickering, shouted Thatcher, if he hadn't started in the first place. The vote stands three to two, and there is only one vote remaining. All around the table, all eyes turned to Emma. She swallowed nervously, but then she straightened up. She was much a member of this crew as anyone. She wasn't even sure the ship would still be afloat if it wasn't for her. The others seemed to feel at least some of that, too. And as she waited in silence for her vote, she looked up at them and cleared her throat with a bit more confidence and began to speak. If I had loved Spain, I would have not left it, she said, opening a simple statement to the fact before trying to mine her feelings further. To be poor and parentless girl in a nation is to know its soul. She paused quite proud of herself for forming such a fine phrase in English. I did not come here to listen to political theories, growled Thatcher. She cut him off with a glare and then he shut his mouth and looked away, not wanting to antagonize her before her vote. And Spain, though I think is not always been, but now she suddenly, her English had grown elusive again. She is a gloton. You understand? A glutton, said Henry. Greedy. See, si, yes, said Emma. She opened her mouth and raised one finger so that no one would cut her off, and she searched for the right words. For Spain, the Spain she knew was greedy. She had been at the docks, hungry and looking for work, as they were overworked crews and 
offloaded, helping keeping piles of gold and silver and sugar from the empire's far-flung colonies. All the wealth, and where did it go? Not to the people, not to the orphans left starving in the streets. It made her hungry, but there was no one to complain to, and she knew how ruthlessly the crown put down any challenge of his authority at home. She had heard it did far, far worse out in those ludicrous colonies. She glanced at the back bank of windows and corrected herself, out in these ludicrous colonies. How could she trust her fate to such an authority and in such a place? She looked over her sister. Maria was confident that they'd be allowed to go on their way and find work on the next ship. But Maria was reasonably, she was reasonably sure was wrong. More likely, they would be pressed into a grim service, slaves to the crown, if not to the name, then the practice. And that was if they could continue to pass as boys. How long could that go on? And where will it end? She hardly dared consider. Then again, her sister's wounded foot seemed to get worse each day, but the moment had stretched on too long. Her open mouth was a danger of catching flies, and the others were growing impatient. Thatcher shifted loud in a chair. Owen cleared his throat. I have made up my mind, said Emma, blurted, hoping that staying would make it so, saying it would make it so. The others leaned in around the little table. The next sound was of, that, of Emma's deci decisive vote. It was a sudden crash and a sound of splintering wood. What was that, said Thatcher? Could it be the mass again, said Maria? Have we sprung another yard? Emma looked at her. She was disappointed that her sister would play along with this awful game, but she understood it down to her bones. It was simple. Human desire for self-preservation. Somehow it made Emma, like them, all a little more even as it made her hate them a little bit. The cabin walls were thick. The door was closed and there was a hold together inside the long oversized Owen and his gun. It would be easy to stay this way, to hunker down, except they weren't all huddled together inside. Sickened by the conspiracy of inaction, even as she took the part in it, Emma finally managed to say the word they were all thinking. Aaron, she breathed. And then it was as if she had broken the spell. They rose as one, and Maria on her tender foot, Emma unsheathed in the first of her two knives, and the others put their own weapons from their belts and grabbed one of the spears that now lined the cabin. That was no sprung yard, said Owen. Come on! Emma met his eyes. He had said just a few moments earlier she would have been proud of him. As it was, they didn't even make it to the door before they had heard a scream. It was an awful thing, a high pitch and ragged, and it cut through the walls of the cabin. Speaking of both pain and fear, Owen flung open the door. Already pointing the pistol out into the sunlight, he rushed under the deck. Thatcher crowded out next, then Emma and Henry, bumping shoulders as they pressed through the narrow door. There, said Henry, pointing toward the aft hatch. The boards had been nailed over, were shattered and scattered, and disappearing Back down in the dark hole, at its center, was a creature's bulbous dark abdomen and the last of its six legs. And then Emma saw something else, something she wished she hadn't. It was a hand, Aaron's hand. It reached back around the creature's hulking body and grabbed the edge of one of the hatch. There was a sharp crack and a quick sizzling as a flintlock ignited and charged. Her crack went the pistol, a flash of flame billing the puma smoke and forth. The ball struck. What she could only think of was, was the fat red balloon at the end of the beast, protruding a quick puff of white powder. What had Henry called them? Spores? The thing was lined with them. She covered her mouth and, and her nose, but kept her eyes wide open. And so she saw Aaron's feeble grip torn from the hatchway as the creature disappeared, quick with a flick of a tongue, down into the dark belly of the ship. The sea breeze quickly disappeared, both the gun smoke and the floating spores, carrying them over the rail in a thin and it thinned them into invisibility. She lowered her hand from her mouth, and the air, air she sucked in a smell of a sulfurous and hot as a devil's own domain. It took him, said Henry. His voice was thick with sadness, but Thatcher turned on him anyway. What was it you said, he snarled? We have a responsibility to science? He swung around, waving the hatchet wildly, that it seemed to certain to drop in one of them. Instead, he pointed it down to the dark, torn hole of the hatch. Well, if it seems that science feels no responsibility to us. Beside them, Owen rushed back to the cabin and reloaded. I have it wounded, he said, and reached the door. I have it shot in its monstrous rear. And then he disappeared inside, and they were left with nothing but that sharpened steel between them and the gaping hole in the deck. Thatcher swung back around, once again, almost clipping Henry with a gleaming blade of the hatchet. Well, he said, what do you have to say about that? Henry blinked at him if he was waking from a dream. It was waiting, he whispered. What was? What's that, said Thatcher, who honestly seemed not to have heard. It was waiting for one of us to be alone, said Henry louder this time. Thatcher had taken back. He loaded his hatchet and Emma let out a, out the breath she'd been holding. 
Is it truly that intelligent? Henry nodded, and then all of them turned to look at the gaping hole in the deck. It is wounded now, said Maria, holding onto the railing to take the weight off her, her own wound. Henry shook his head. A nuisance to it at best, he said. It was not a vital area, and it will not feel the pain as we do. Emma scowled at him. Will you ever have any good news? Suddenly, Owen reappeared, causing them to all jump. Gah! Do not speak up. Sneak up on us like that, snapped Maria. Not now. Sorry, said Owen, speaking to Maria, but staring straight down into the open hatchway. Emma admired his focus. It seemed entirely appropriate, but it was also why he never saw Thatcher swing the hatchet. Hmm. Wonder what is going to happen next. We will find out tomorrow in Chapter 28. Have a good day, everybody.